Well, meeting to order at seven o'clock. This is the regular meeting of the Kalen Board of Education. We'd like to inform all board meeting attendees that this meeting is being live streamed and archived for access at any time by our community members on the internet within 24 to 48 hours of the meeting's conclusion. You will rise with me and say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And a roll call, please. Mrs. Witt. Here. Mr. Gonzalez. Here. Mrs. Junk. Here. Mr. Carey. Here. Mr. Mankiewski. Here. Mrs. Simmons. Here. Dr. Lawler will be arriving later. That's six members present. We have a quorum. Would any board members uh, like to move anything from the consent agenda to new business? I would. I would like to move H4. The approval of the Fox Valley Career Center fees for use of Caneland facilities? Correct. Okay, so H4 now becomes J5. And are there any others? Seeing none, um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. Can I roll call, please? Mr. Gonzalez? Aye. Mrs. Junk? Aye. Mr. Carey? Aye. Mr. Mankitsky? Aye. Mrs. Simmons? Aye. Mrs. Witt? Aye. Motion carries 6 0. It's time for the board and superintendent salutes. Yes, thank you. Um, last Monday, on the 22nd of November, we had our annual Ignite conference and wanted to uh, salute the Ed Services Department, uh, Dr. Bum, Mr. Raleigh, Mrs. Garland, and Miss Emory Franz as they plan and organize uh, that conference. It takes months to plan it, and it's a uh, rather large undertaking that about 400 staff members from across the district attend uh, several workshops and presentations and work sessions, and it's a, uh, it's a large undertaking, so I'd like to salute our head services department, as well as also at that conference, we have a number of staff members and administrators that also present uh, as district uh, experts, so we have about 50 of our teachers, administrators, and support staff that present and share workshops, so the, the entire day is a, a large undertaking, so I'd also like to recognize the, the 50 presenters on that day in addition to services. So I've mentioned to them a number of times how much we appreciate it, but I'll also share with them on behalf of the board the salute and thanks for their work. Um, then the other one that we have was uh, on Dr. Adkins come up to the microphone. Um, at the beginning of the year, we introduced our new staff and had a meet and greet and then our new teaching staff, but our support staff tonight, um, I'll turn over to Dr. Adkins and he can share a little recognition for them and of them. Good evening. Thank you. So um, as you are well aware, there are quite a lot of things that happen in a public school district. It is more than um, the sum of any single piece, but it's truly the sum of the parts. And there are lots and lots of moving parts to a school district that um, we don't bring forward um, when we bring our new teachers, but are nonetheless as equally important. So we have a whole plethora of support staff that are new to the district this year. We still have more to hire. But um, we have a whole bunch that we'd like to recognize tonight. We have um, so far onboarded 39 different employees. Um, we have three food service staff, six paraprofessionals, three admin building administrative assistants, um, one certified nurse at one of our elementary schools. We have a new maintenance um, staff member, 15 monitors, an occupational therapist, three district office admi um, administrative assistants, four crossing guards, and two information technology interns. So we still have plenty of monitors, um, crossing guards, substitutes, a whole variety of support staff that we do, still need to hire yet. Wanted to take a moment to recognize those 39 people that come in every day, do things either with students or behind the scenes for students to make sure that we can run and operate on a regular basis. We could not do it without them. So wanted to recognize them with the board. Um, we're looking forward to future years having a similar event that we have with our staff, our teaching staff, where they are able to come and physically meet with you and, and be welcomed to the district and just connect with you as the board. So just wanted to recognize them tonight and thank them for everything that they do for our students day in and day out. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, then the last um, note is just for our next meeting at the December uh, board meeting. We'll have recognition of our Harder Middle School and Kinney High School athletic and activities from the fall. So we usually have uh, your principal or athletic director over here to share and highlight a number of the fall activities and athletics. So that's what we'll have for the next meeting. That is all I have for tonight. Okay. Dr. Fuchs. I don't have any I, I just, yeah, briefly, since we touched on it, I just would like to thank the administration and, you know, Dr. Adkins, uh, with this competitive environment, thank you for all the hard work you did in, in finding these individuals because, um, you know, the, the, the needs are there, and so we appreciate um, all the effort and work that goes into that as well, so thank you. Here, here. Okay, uh, moving on, the consent agenda tonight contains the following action items. The approval of accounts payable and payroll for November 2022. The approval of minutes of the November 14, 2022 regular meeting. The approval of personnel. And the following informational items, the student suspension data report. Sorry. Kittens, huh? Yes. Yep. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. So moved. Second. And roll call, please. Mrs. Jump. Aye. Mr. Carey. Aye. Mr. Mankiewski. Aye. Mrs. Simmons. Aye. Mrs. Witt. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Motion carries 6 0. This is the first opportunity for public comment, and we don't have anyone signed up. Does anyone intend to speak at the first public comment? If not, I'm going to skip the spiel, and if anybody wants to sign up during the meeting, that's great, and then I'll, we'll revisit it at the second opportunity at the end of the meeting. We'll move on to new business. Um, the first item is J1, is the approval of the KHS building repair of HVAC control system. Yep. Thank you, uh, President Witt. I'll turn that one over to Dr. Poops. I know Mr. Page is also here to answer any questions that people may have. Thank you very much. Uh, as we've talked about, we have a number of uh, systems that came on high school that are aging. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had one of the HVAC control units failed. Uh, Mr. Payton is here tonight to answer any technical questions that you have regarding the failure and or the recommendation. Um, he's brought to us several recommendations from TRAIN and our recommendation is at this time that the board consider replacing all three of the outdated units. Um, the reason why is that would bring this building, the high school, up to current technology, as well as provide spare parts, which are um, difficult to come by for uh, Meredith, Blackberry, and McDowell. And so the cost for this is $124,355 which is over the administrative authority of 25,000. Typically we would budget for something like this, but as you know, it was an unexpected expenditure. The expenditure will come from O&M and the correct account, and we'll find a way to move money around, hopefully to cover it. And so um, with that being said, if you have questions, Mr. Payton is ready to answer. <laughs> So is this part of the referendum question? This, these were things that were supposed to be included in all of that? Yes, ma'am. But circumstances make it so it has to happen sooner? Yes. Yes, okay. If, if, if we purchase these units, particularly for the high school, and then let's say everything works out with the referendum, Will these units be able to be used or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we can, um, we're it, just getting ahead of them? It's current technology. So it would not be something that would have to be redone. Uh, if the referendum were to pass and we were to work on those infrastructure things, this would just help integrate new uh, new HVAC devices. Um, it would make the transition easier for some of those, and it would probably reduce the amount uh, by a little bit how much we need to spend on infrastructure because that would have been part of that piece of the referendum question. So that failed a couple of weeks ago. Still have heat in the building. So how I guess I'm 
it's a lot of manual work. Uh, you go around to the different units and start them in the morning and shut them down at the end of the day kind of a thing. You can uh, put schedules into the individual units, but as you know, we have a lot of uh, moving pieces with the school. It's not just on at seven, off at three. Um, you know, every time there's a, uh, uh, I can, we, we call it an exception, but somebody's staying late to run a club or somebody's, uh, the district office needs to be open later or come in earlier or on a weekend or something like that. Somebody's got to run around to all the different air handlers and, and take care of that. Where normally it's done from your desk. It's a pretty simple process. Now you're climbing ladders and, and things like that. So. so how many hours a day are you having someone just guess? It's probably an extra hour a day. Um, that we're taking somebody away from something else they could be done. Um, the other piece of that is there's a lot of automated stuff that would normally happen through the building automation system uh, for protection in really cold weather. And since we're running up to that time of year, that's what scares me more than anything is we start to freeze coils and stuff like that. The expenses can pile up pretty fast. Okay. Fair enough. Other questions? Okay, if not, I will entertain a motion that the Board of Education directs the administration to purchase three train SC building control units off of the state bid list at a cost of $124,355. The purpose of the purchase is to replace the failed KHS HVAC building control unit along with the two other units at Kalen High School, which will allow for spare parts to be used at other schools. Does all of that need to be in the motion, or just can we stop at 124.355? You can stop there. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Sure. <clears throat> How soon can we actually get these? Are these? Uh, they're holding one of them for us right now, and then they'll put us in the queue for the other two uh, to get those rolling. Um, but they're right now for the next couple of days, they're just going to hold one of the SC units for us so that we can get this one unit that's already failed up and going again. So is the queue six months, six weeks, six days? They they won't provide a, <laughs> a timeline on that. Everything is just so nuts right now. That's what um, I kind of thought you were going to say. But that's that why they're recommending get in this queue now because, you know, if you months. decide six months from now that you want to do it, well, then you got to add all that lead time to it down the road. And additionally, if another one <laughs> breaks and we're not in the queue, now we're down two. Yeah. That's so hopefully another one doesn't break and then we can wait till the bond issue wants to. Right. There's pie in the sky for you. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. A roll call whenever you're ready. Wait, I think motion. We, well, did we do the motion? No. no. I thought we, we did. We never got the motion done. So moved. Second. <laughs> okay. Now a roll call, please. Mr. Carey. Aye. Mr. Mankiewski. Aye. Mrs. Simmons. Aye. Mrs. Witt. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mrs. Junk. Aye. Motion carries 6 0. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Page. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Page. Thanks. Item J2 in new business is the presentation of the current progress of the Caneland Ignite Personalized Learning Academy. Yep. Over the last uh, year and a half or so, we've had regular updates on uh, personalized learning, Caneland Connects to be planned, and then also um, regular updates from Mrs. Garland on the Ignite Academy. And so just following that timeline, following the regular updates as we lead to the opening next fall, just wanted to provide an updated presentation with the most recent information that we have as we get ready to head into the holiday. Good evening. Good evening. You got the clicker? Okay. The clicker. All right. So we are here, like uh, Dr. Layden shared, to provide an update on where we are with the progress of uh, creating Ignite Academy. Um, as you know, personalized learning has been a goal of our district uh, since about 2015. We really started to dig into that work. Um, and since then, we have uh, made a lot of progress with embedding personalized practices across Caneland within all Caneland schools. Um, also, as you know, Caneland 2020 as well as Caneland Connects, uh, both of those strategic plans specifically uh, have strands related to personalized learning, and we have worked to reach the goals related to uh, the, uh, both of those strategic plans. Uh, Caneland Connects specifically talked about the creation of uh, personalized academy for our students, and so we're right on target with what the strategic plan had identified for us to do. 
Um, we did have a little bit of a slowdown with that academy during the pandemic. The goal was to actually open this year, but we had that delayed by one year due to um, all of those issues that we've encountered since uh, uh, March of 2020. Um, and so as we've progressed for forward, we are on target to open in the fall of 2023 for uh, students in grades four through eight. And we'll talk a little bit about the possibility of extending that to third grade as well. Um, and we've hosted four community events so far, one this past spring, three this uh, during the fall, um, an open house out at Ignite Academy so families could see uh, where the uh, classes will be held. We've shared some information um, through some presentations in that format. We've also um, have had our district wide emails. We've attended curriculum nights. We've uh, put information out in the KCN, social media, all of those uh, uh, avenues we have to make sure that our families are aware of the opportunity that we've created within our district. Um, and so we were super excited to open that enrollment after all of that preparation and years of planning. Uh, the uh, enrollment window did open for early registration October 1st, and that ran throughout the month of October. Um, at the end of October, we did close that early window and guaranteed those families that had registered um, a spot at the academy. And so all of those families have had communication confirming um, their placement at Ignite for the 23-24 school year. Um, and then on November 1st, we opened that regular enrollment window and um, that will remain open through uh, December 16th. And at that point, we'll close registration and communicate uh, if there is a need to run um, a lottery system or if those families uh, is, can also then be confirmed that they have that spot. Our current enrollment numbers as of uh, this morning, we actually updated them just a bit. So there, there uh, have been a couple additional registrations. So fourth and fifth grade right now, we actually have 27 students registered. Um, and then six through eight, we actually have 51 students registered. So the total, uh, and then our third grade wait list. So originally the plan was to open for fourth through eighth grades. Um, as we started to communicate out to our schools and families, we did receive several emails from families of current second grade students who were interested um, in opportunities of how could their students participate in this initial year as well. Um, second grade was the only grade level that we received those types of inquiries from. Um, and so we had the conversation about if we did have the interest, ideally, we want to be able to provide this opportunity to any families in the district that are interested. Um, and if we have that large number at a particular grade level and we can make that work with the learning continuums that we're using. Um, we did establish that wait list and communicate it out to all second grade families that we were establishing a wait list and should we not reach maximum enrollment of 50 fourth and fifth graders by December 16th then we'll go ahead and open to those 12 third graders as well. So assuming we um, have the space for those 12 third graders, we would include those students as well in um, the 23-24 school year. So if those 12 third graders attend, we would be up to 90 students enrolled uh, in grades three, th three through eight in the fall as of this morning, but registration won't close until December 16th. So is the, sorry, uh, no, go ahead. I don't know if you want questions now or at the end. Um, is the third, including the third grade, the ones on the wait list, is that an all or nothing thing? Like either all of them can fit in and we take them all. It's not going to be like there's a lottery for the third graders. There may it. have to be a lottery okay. for those third graders. It We're not going to exceed the maximum capacity of 50 at that grade span. Okay. Then you're not going to just run it with fewer students. You might as well. Ideally, we want to be able to include as many students as we possibly can. So it's looking positive that we can have that nice, clean, <laughs> bring them all in, I think yeah. would definitely be our, our ideal situation. Okay, thank you. So um, next with this comes just an update on the staffing process and, and how we do things. As the board knows, um, we typically run a teacher preference survey in the middle of the year and over the winter to inquire from our current staff what they're thinking about um, placements for the following year. Um, this year, because of the Personalized Learning Academy, we actually pushed that out earlier. We pushed that out, I believe, in September um, to get feedback from our staff about who might be interested in serving at the Ignite Academy. Um, we then did internal postings, followed all, all of our posting procedures and requirements, um, and interviewed interested internal candidates. Based on the current enrollment, um, and the three that enrolled over the weekend, 
um, doesn't change this part of it. Um, we do have um, two elementary staff tentatively assigned to the Ignite Academy. We have two middle school staff tentatively assigned. We have one special ed teacher tentatively assigned and one PE slash pathways teacher tentatively assigned to the academy. Um, we are going to be posting externally because we've had it internally for um, the required amount of time now for that um, seventh FTE for the pathways teacher. Um, when you think pathways, that's gonna look a little bit different um, at Ignite in that um, it's going to be, exploratory is probably the, the, the closest analogy, an exploratory teacher, but it may not be just an art teacher or a just a music teacher. They may end up doing a variety of different things with um, personal finance, business, art, music, PE, not quite sure yet, still working out some of those details dependent on students, grade levels, grade spans, those kinds of things. So there are still some variables to work through. Um, so this is where we have tentatively assigned staff so far based on the enrollment. And just like any other building, any other grade span, any other year, as we enroll more students, we would then need to allot more um, staff to the Personalized Learning Academy to make sure that we can run those classes, those sections, those grades. Next steps, um, we're going to continue to monitor that enrollment as um, Mrs. Garland mentioned it closes on December 16th, so we'll have hopefully a clearer picture of what the total student enrollment looks like at that time. Um, we do have to go through a process of making sure that any students who've enrolled that may have um, IEP needs or other various needs have those needs met. That's why we already have one special ed teacher assigned tentatively to the Personalized Learning Academy because um, we do have some of those needs that will need to be met with the current enrollment. But should we get more students with more needs, we would have that factored in as well. Um, as Dr. Er, getting ahead of myself, as Mrs. Garland has mentioned a couple of times um, with the staffing, we do have a concept of 50 elementary and 150 middle school students for the Personalized Learning Academy. So please know we're not going to, at the first year of this program, be looking to exceed that 200 student mark. Um, we hope to get as close to it as possible, and whether that includes those third graders or not, um, will be more known to us in a couple of weeks. I'm sorry, you said, yeah. didn't you say 90 earlier and now just 200? I'm confused. 90 students have currently enrolled, but we have a cap of 200. Okay. When we initially outlaid how this would look, class size, <laughs> desks, staff, all of that, we were shooting for 200. Okay. We only have 90 so far. All right, thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to make sure that we monitor, um, as we do every year with every staffing plan, the impact um, of all of our other buildings. Um, the board, I'm sure, will be able to see at the minimum staffing plan in March how all of this lays out as one more cog in that very complex wheel of staffing. <clears throat> we'll make sure that um, a difference in the minimum staffing plan this coming year, in prior years, you had elementary, middle, and high school, and then we talk about special ed and differentials. There'll be a personalized learning academy component of that presentation, so you'll see exactly how that piece fits into the puzzle. Um, and then as we continue on through the remainder of this year with those tentatively assigned staff, we're talking about professional development, welcome activities for students, finalizing some of our logistics, um, working with all of our various labor groups, et cetera, to make sure that it kicks off very smoothly and is a very successful year for us. All right, so then as we look forward, uh, the next steps that we plan on taking, still a lot of work to be done. We've, we've turned some major corners in terms of having that staff, um, at least our initial staff identified. Um, that December 16th date will be huge for us to know um, the specific students and start to be able to find out what their specific needs are will help us, um, I think, further dig into some of these logistics. Um, but we do look forward to it continuing to work to increase the enrollment within the academy. Um, we still are um, working with the plan to increase uh, one year of high school per each each con there's never really a good way to say that each consecutive year will add a year of high school so in 2024 ninth grade following year 10th grade so students who start this fall as eighth graders will be able to continue throughout their um, high school experience uh, we definitely are looking forward to showcasing the inevitable success that our students are going to have at ignite academy and um, very much looking forward to being able to develop a site that can serve as um, learning experiences for other local schools. The interesting thing about personalized learning, we were just having this conversation this morning that there are as many definitions of personalized
personalized learning as there are districts in the country. And um, every program is different and there's different elements. We uh, were on a site visit at a, a personalized high school this afternoon. Um, some of the elements are consistent with what we're looking to do and some are a bit different. Um, so there's a real opportunity here for us to showcase what we're doing in Caneland and uh, become a host site ourselves, ideally is what we'd like to do. Um, and then uh, obviously, uh, share out our work on a larger stage to continue to, um, I think, showcase the unique and innovative things that are happening at Caneland that are not necessarily happening in, in other districts. Um, and we would, of course, continue to provide updates to the board along the way, um, not just with our own program, but how we're uh, sharing out in that larger audience what we're doing. All right, using uh, Mrs. McCoy's famous questions, Questions, comments, or compliments is her favorite <laughs> one to add. <laughs> I know you've spoken to this over the presentations in the past. The only feedback that I've really gotten from the community is where's the money coming from for the teachers? Could you just sure. So um, again, I, I mentioned earlier that it's one piece of a very complex process. So one of the first things that I would mention is that as there is every year as we see increases or decreases of, of FTE needs at different levels, that may be offset by other places. So for example, in prior years, we may have gone down a couple of FTE in one grade span, but then up a couple of FTE in the, in the next grade span. And as a net to the district, it was up or down one FTE one way or the other. So there's a, there'll be a similar, I don't know exactly what it looks like yet, there's still too many variables, but there, I'm sure there'll be some sort of offsetting as we go through the whole process. The other piece to know is that in the financial projections that were shared with the board and presented to the board, when we initially looked at the 200 students, that would have required 16 FTE added into the allotment, but we're only at the seven right now. And of the seven, some of those maybe, don't know yet, offset by other increases or decreases of the grade spans. So way too complex right now today, but those are the two big levers that I would consider. Hit that last point again for me. It'll, it's an offset. You're moving staff from one building to another. And there is potentially an offset. We don't know yet. And there might be an increase. Correct. And we projected, we have financial projections totals, that include. Might be an increase of staff. Might be um, an offset. It's going to be an offset in some way, uh, in some number. So it might end up being with those seven staff because of where students are coming from and other things, it might be a total increase of 0.3, it might be flat, it depends on the numbers, where the students are coming from, and projections and all the rest of the classing and classes and staffing that's brought forward in March. If so you just, recall, sorry, go ahead. That's fine. I'm sorry. Um, so if all of the third graders came were to move from one building, like they're all at Blackbird Creek, the kids that are in there, get moved over, that would be moving one FTE or from BlackBerry to Ignite? Theor Generally, theoretically, so yes. That would be what I would call a direct offset. Okay. We went directly down one here and up one there. But as we've talked about in every minimum staffing plan for the last seven years, the numbers are never clean like that. So right. that very rarely, if ever, happens. However, you have one up or down at one grade span, maybe some students shift to the middle school. As we recall, we've had that bubble that went through and I believe they're what, juniors now? Mm -hmm. they're, anyway, as that's gone through, you've seen a decrease as they move through a grade span, but then a reciprocal <laughs> increase at the next grade span. So similar dynamic, but now it also includes the Personalized Learning Academy. Yeah, you're welcome, question. Any other questions? What's next? I mean, are you guys trying to shoot for the 200? Are you guys going to have more meetings? Um, yeah, what we, it's kind of that time game. So ideally we would love to leave that registration open as long as possible, but as you just heard, a lot of that staffing decision and the other buildings, so many things play off of each other and it's sort of that domino effect that we really do need to keep a, de a definitive final registration date and whatever that number is on December 16th is what that number will be so that we can plan we have to start thinking about transportation. Well, we've already thought extensively about transportation. We need to start finalizing some transportation um, types of things, staffing things. 
Um, Extracurriculars. Yeah, yeah. Um, we really need to start investigating of these registered students, what interests do they have to participate in other types of activities being offered at the home schools and things like that. So um, we would love to get as close to that 200, but 90 certainly in the first year of a, of a new program that we're looking to build, we're, we're very happy with that number as well. So parents need to know they, the that there's still, yep, in December 16th, yep. To be, mm -hmm. all those other logistics that need to happen. So, Absolutely, yep. So they're kind of You're on the fence December 16th, okay. yep. Right. Or or right now. Fill that out right now. <laughs> Do you find any school, like, is there one school more than another kids are coming from, or is it kind of even across from all the Um things? Well, Harder, obviously, just because three of the grade levels are right. from Harder. Elementary-wise, um, pretty pretty even. I, I thought maybe the North End might have a little bit more just proximity, but um, McDowell has a, a nice showing. It's it's relatively balanced within, you know, five or so students, um, pretty, pretty equally distributed. I think you kind of answered my question um, to what you were just saying, but I'd imagine you guys came into this with a target. You were looking, you know, the first year to meet a certain amount, a certain mm -hmm. enrollment. Um, and it sounds like you're there or close to there. Yeah, so the goal, the target, or the cap for students in the first year was 50 fourth and fifth graders and 150 um, sixth through eighth graders. 200. So 200 total, and we're just under half of that right now. Um, so that's, that's... I, I think a good showing in our first year. Are you year, finding actually. that the community they, that there's a, there's enough interest, uh, as much interest as you expected, or are you finding less interest, more? I would say probably pretty much as expected. I think it's difficult because it's it's not just a new program, but it's a new way of instructing students that's different than what most of our families or parents themselves had experienced in their own education. So it's just it's a different concept. Uh, probably the most um, profound comment I've gotten from a parent has been, um, as you listen to to what Ignite has to offer, if your student needs that, you know it instantly. As soon as you start describing the program, a parent said, if, the, if your child needs this type of learning, you'll know the minute you start hearing about Ignite. If you don't understand it, most likely it, your student doesn't have the needs that um, Ignite is designed to meet. And I thought that was a good um, explanation. So there's certainly nine, the way I like to think of it is there's 90 students currently in our school system that for one reason or another aren't specifically having their needs met in the way that they need to the extent that that um, they're looking for a new way of instruction. And so these are 90 kids we potentially can reach in a much more meaningful way than we're currently able to. And that to me, if it's even 10 kids, that's that's incredible. And the fact that it's 90 is, is wonderful. Sure. It's, so this being our, our last question, I promise. Sure, this no, being our, our first year, um, it's it these types of programs exist in other districts um do you have any data uh on what their first year enrollment was like and you know what it took to ramp up and and where we sit compared yeah so um pr i would say relatively similar at the site visit we went to today we asked that question and um they said about 60 percent was their first year's enrollment um in terms of they their max is 120 students um and they talked about in their first year they've They've been open, gosh, I think it was about 12 years. Um, it started as a different type of high school, transitioned about five years ago to a personalized high school. They had about 60% enrollment their first year, and now they have a waiting list every quarter of students uh, wanting to get in. Um, that school's in Arlington Heights. Uh, Compass Academy is similar-ish. Like I said, there's no one program that's exactly like what we're trying to do. Um, and Compass was uh, a, probably, I would say, about 80% based on the informational um, sessions that I attended and when they opened. So it seems maybe about 75 would be a good guesstimate of about where similar programs start. Sure. And I know it's difficult because no yeah, two it, programs are the same, but I'm just, mm -hmm. just curious. But I think in terms of any brand new program, what would be a good percentage to aim for? And it's most of those that we talk to, it's somewhere between that 60 to 80%. Do you see from the other schools kind of like more conservative the first year, but then when families start seeing 
it in process. They hear stories from those parents that are sending kids there that the second year, the numbers that, jump. Yeah. That's what almost all of the schools we've talked to have said is that it's generally word of mouth. It's, it's based on, um, you know, my neighbor down the street student received this type of um, experience and we're looking for something similar. Um, so they definitely talked about word of mouth being a big way because we specifically asked, how did you make sure that everybody in your community was aware of the opportunity or, um, you know, what were some of those PR types of um, efforts that were successful or um, just how do you, that I think was our first thought is how do we make sure everybody's aware that this even is a possibility? Um, and most said it's the same things we've been doing, but then that word of mouth once, once it opens and you're able to sort of show and have students, I think, articulate their own experience. That by far on our site visits has been the most powerful thing to hear students themselves talk about their experience, their type of learning, um, the impact it's had on them. So hopefully once we get our students talking and advocating, <laughs> I think that they'll be probably the strongest advocates for, for that type of learning. My only last question is, so if parents still have questions, who do they contact? You email me, Laura Garland, 10166 at caneland.org. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's one of the things that's still outstanding. I know you're talking about the logistics and everything of how to get move kids around. Um, so that there's, there's one full-time special education teacher, but there are those services for students, um, let's say students requiring speech services. You know, that's a specialized special education teacher or a speech language pathologist. How, how are those, you do, have you thought about how those services mm -hmm. are going to happen? Yep, so, we, sorry, that's sort Go of ahead. a joint question, yeah. but I will at least share that we have at this point um, went through I, any student that has an IEP that's already registered. We went through and looked at what those services are, um, started to get an idea of what those minutes look like. We do not have enough students who need those types of services to um, justify a full-time employee in those areas. So we've started to work with uh, Mrs. Eggleston on what will those shared um, services look like. It's going to depend on the specific number of minutes, the frequency, but most likely those are going to be um, serviced by other therapeutic positions already um, employed in the district. Okay. We'd work within the special ed workload, make the, the committee that we have and the guidelines that we have to make sure that um, we're able to provide those services without overly taxing or burdening any existing staff. Mm -hmm. And are, will it require any additional um, paraprofessionals or anything? Do we have any students with special needs that are going to require a parapro? I don't or? believe we have any students that need a one-on-one -on -one at this time. Okay. But there will be um, speak positions tied to this. For example, a nurse. You may need okay. a nurse. We'll need a building secretary. And so those are all components that are built into um, our financial projections and our strategic planning for the Personalized Learning Academy. Okay. Thank you. I'm excited. Very exciting. Wish my kids were. Well, I don't wish my kids were still in school. <laughs> <laughs> a lot easier now. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, that was just for informational purposes. We're moving on now to um, J3, which is the presentation of financial practices for the Fox Valley Career Center. Yep. Is Dr. Burke. If Dr. Birchall comes up to the microphone, um, in the packet, in the J3, you saw mm -hmm. the two or three pages with some financials. Also, you'll see on the screen is some um, a PowerPoint that Dr. Birchall put together to follow. That's also in your packet that looks like this. So when he starts to reference that, he also wanted to have a visual talking point for the audience and for the board members. So this is a lot of the same information that is in the um, J3 uh, agenda item. So with that, I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Birchall. He'll walk us through, answer some questions that we have. If there's anything um, financially related to it, Dr. Fuchs can also help. And if there's anything Fox Valley Career Center board member related, I'm happy to answer those questions too. Dr. Birchall. All right, well, I'm excited. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's one of my favorite subjects to talk about is Fox Valley. <laughs> And I have to just pause for a second. The folks in my office were concerned that I, I typically look like I came out of a shop. So they gave me this bow tie with little bicycles on it and matching socks tonight. And I was to definitely wear them so that I look good for this presentation. So I, you're my witnesses. I did it, OK? Um, so just want to just briefly review. Am I doing this right? 
probably if I turn it on, I do better. Ah, there, there we go. All right. Because um, I know there's some folks that have been on tours and have been to Fox Valley, and some of you haven't. So I'm going to pause just for a minute and give you a little historical background. Um, we began in, in the 1969 school year, a cooperative venture from uh, Southern Kane schools. So our initial schools were St. Charles, Batavia, Caneland, uh, Burlington Central. And um, so the goal was, was that these schools, we would uh, offer career uh, and vocational training in programs that the schools didn't have the capacity to offer on their own. Um, just because of enrollment, sometimes you know that works that you can offer a full program and sometimes you can't. But if you can pool those students, the, the thought is that you can offer these programs. It came to Caneland because quite honestly, Caneland had the most space. Um, and so because you had the land out here, that's why the, the group agreed at that point to build the addition onto Caneland High School to house Fox Valley. Um, as part of the whole Fox Valley piece in the charter though, um, Caneland High School uh, and Caneland School District agreed to be our fiscal and administrative agent. Um, and then because it's housed here, essentially all capital uh, equipment that belongs to Fox Valley really belongs to Caneland. So we may purchase it, but if you kick this out tomorrow, you're going to keep the equipment because it's yours. All right, that's part of the, the agreement. Um, what that means practically for Caneland, though, is that you do get four in, uh, intro classes and that sort of thing to use Fox Valley equipment um, and expertise because we're maintaining the shop and the equipment. So that goes back kind of to the beginning. Um, again, the goal was that we would be able to um, find ways to get students involved. The fun part for us, oh, there's a lot of fun parts, but we're very excited because we get lots of students from different districts and they get a chance to mix with other people and it really broadens their horizons. The other thing that's really nice is that all of our programs have a business advisory committee and that team of business owners and, and sometimes uh, other educators come together and we do that once or twice a year and they get a chance to tour and look at our shops. They get a chance to look at our programs and curriculum and give us feedback. Um, and so a number of years ago we had in our welding program, uh, we asked some folks from Caterpillar who were on our committee at the time, uh, you know, our students weld but you're not hiring as many as we would hope. Why? And they said, well, it's because they weld really well, but they don't know how to read blueprints. And so you can't take them in a shop and point to them and say, stick this together. That's not a welding term, but in any case, um, th because they didn't know how to do that. So we revamped our program so that all of our students spend one day a week um, studying technical drawings, doing sketching, doing the blueprints so that they're much they're a better employee at that point. So that's a really important part for us because we like to feel that we are listening and responding to the needs of the community. The other thing that's, that's fun, um, we're a little different than most career centers in the state um, for a number of reasons, but one of them is that we work with multiple community colleges. So Southern Kane, which would include Caneland, we work with Wabansi Community College. If you look at our St. Charles and Central School Districts, they're part of Northern Kane, so then we have agreements with Elgin Community College. And then if we offer programs like in the past, Small Engines or Horticulture, which neither of those schools work with, we actually have agreements with Kishwaukee Community College so that our students can continue to get college credit and we're not stepping on anybody's toes in that way. In fact, we did at one point have an agreement with Sauk Valley College for a fire science program as well. That's a little bit of a hike for our students, but. Um, the college credit counted nonetheless. So um, the other part of that though is that because our students earn the college credit, many of our staff members then are also adjunct uh, instructors at the community colleges and we use the college curriculum textbooks and then grading practices so that our students are earning the, the, the credit. So uh, I will move on. I just wanted because some of you haven't seen some of those things, I won't, I'm not going to read to you because you're all really smart. But these are the programs that we're offering right now. If you were to go back and look in the, some of our past, we've offered everything from stenography to, to culinary arts to ag mechanics um, to uh, an early robotics class that had a really interesting uh, concept to it. So we've done a number of things. We've also offered business English and math uh, a long time ago, and we had pretty big numbers, which I think Dr. Fuchs could give us some stories about if we... <laughs> head to time. Um, so those are these classes and I think Mr. Carey you've got at least one daughter in one of those. 
A um, couple of them. Couple. Um, and then we've got uh, just some more classes. And again, these classes are designed um, to meet industry needs. So just I want to highlight briefly uh, HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. It's one of those that local contractors came to us and said in the last few years, we can't find techs. We simply can't hire. Um, so we added a pilot program to our Electrical 2 uh, course and then started reaching out to contractors who donated air conditioners and furnaces. And we are getting our students, last year we had 14 uh, students certified uh, with EPA 608 universal refrigerant licenses. Um, quick side note, I had my furnace serviced for the fall last week. <laughs> And the student that came out and did it is a former Fox Valley student who's now driving his truck and working for a contractor. And he was quite proud to tell me all the things that he's doing. I didn't get a deal, but in any case, I, <laughs> it was fun to see him. And he also has agreed now to be a guest speaker for me. So, you know, you got to be careful if you uh, do that. That slide didn't, didn't translate over very well, did it? Um, I wanted, when I looked at and watched board, conversations, there were a question about fees and then tuition. And I just want to take a second because those are two very different things for Fox Valley. So if it is a fee, it's something the student pays. Okay. And typically our fees are pretty small. They're like $35. But the reason we keep them small is one, we don't want to discourage anybody, but two, many of our programs have specific requirements. So if you're in a requirement like EMT, you've got to have a uniform and stethoscope and, and boots and various things or fire science. If you're in welding, of course, you need a helmet and steel toed boots. There's, there's requirements in addition that you do have to have from a safety standpoint. And so we want to keep the, the cost down for families. So it's a nominal fee. It doesn't really offset a whole lot of the cost but it does indicate some commitment on the student's part. And so fees are student-based. Tuition is what I charge you, all right? So that's the, the difference. Now tuition is really based on what our sending schools pay. And it's not quite formal at this point. It's something we're talking about as a board, but we do have member districts who are not sending students right now. We only bill sending students districts. So if the only way you would get a bill is if you're sending students to us. And then it's the tuition that really is used to pay for um, you know, the item that we pulled out. So looking at, at costs here at Caneland, uh, looking at um, room leases. Uh, we do professional licensing. We, if your student takes a, a class with us and they're going to have a chance for a professional license, we pay for their first test. Um, staff salaries, all of those things. So that's what tuition is used for. But I just want you to keep that in mind. So language-wise, fees, student-based, tuition, district-based. All right? Um, and I wanted just to break out a little bit on the tuition because that's where you guys see it. And I think it's important you have some sense of that. And I, I'm not going to read it all to you, but obviously salaries. Um, if you look at materials and supplies, we buy uh, tons of steel. And I don't know if you've looked at, I know you have at the grocery store and what you're paying, but shipping prices and things on steel, we're paying a lot more than we used to. Refrigerant costs, uh, we used to get a, a container of refrigerant for HVAC and it was $100 a cylinder and it's now $450. And so that happened to us in, in the course of a quarter. So those are things that, are, it, like everybody else, they've just gone up. Ours are somewhat more specific. I waited, I put on there, we, I, we actually do buy zombie blood for EMT. I wondered if anybody had noticed. Um, it's a little unusual. Uh, I always worry that I'm gonna get a message from Dr. Fuchs when the, the supply list includes chainsaws and zombie blood. It sounds like we're doing Halloween things first. Um, software licensure. You know, if you're in the auto program, we're gonna buy you a subscription to ShopKey so that you can look up and, and learn how to, to use something like that for the students. CompTIA, the cybersecurity programs, um, Jupiter Ed, I mentioned the EPA or ASE certification, and of course, the electronic textbooks. Um, and then professional licensure, if you're, again, if you're one of our students and you're taking a class where you can earn a license, we will pay for you to take the test the first time if we think you're ready. If you don't pass it and you want to do it again, then that's on you. But we want to make sure that that's not a, a hindrance for you to, to, to uh, proceed. Facility upgrades, I'll show Dr. you a picture. In, yeah. Sorry, I just want to ask a quick question before you go too far with materials and supplies. You also have relationships with other organizations, right? Like things are donated to you too, so you're able to save some costs. Can you explain? Oh, I know absolutely. Like fire trucks, and some of the fire fire trucks turnout gear. Um, 
which is a really big deal. If you're in northern Kane, so if our students were to go to Elgin for fire, they'd have to provide their own turnout gear, which is very expensive. We provide that for them. It's all donated. Um, I was uh, Tuesday morning, I was down at the Pipe Fitters Union in Mokina, and they donated uh, roughly 10,000 pounds of, of, of steel and um, welding rod to us. Um, and so they've been doing that pretty regularly, which has been a, a big blessing. Um, donated cars. If any of you have an old vehicle you want to get rid of, we'd love to take it off your hands. Um, so we use that sort of thing. So we, we try to use anything that we can, and we love donations. Electronics, people clean out their, their basements of old computers, and that's something that our computer, our PC repair students will you know, love to work on. Um, it's nice. It's a lot more fun to have them replace screens on an, on an Apple uh, iPhone when it's not yours and it's not working to begin with than, uh, <laughs> than when they practice on, on your phone at home. So I, I, did I answer your question? Yeah, I would just, so some of the cost of materials and supplies. Oh, we do anything, we do anything possible. Right. So let's say that you've donated a vehicle. It will be in the auto shop. Our intro kids will practice brake jobs and all of those things on it. Eventually the, it'll get stripped. I mean, it just, things will not work at some point. It will then end up in the fire science program where it will become a tool for Jaws for Life practice. Um, and then it will be in pieces and then we will load it on a trailer and we'll take it to Zimmerman's and DeKalb and we'll sell the scrap metal and we put the money back in the program. So for us, it, it's, we, we were recycling before it was even cool, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah. anyway, no, I thanks. I was just bragging about I, your fire science. I know you've had fire trucks donated. That's a huge cost. The turnout gear, I've seen all that, so. Well, and we try to do, to, to do things so um, wherever we can get anything free. So Kishwaukee College a couple of years ago for our ladder truck, which was donated by the city of Batavia's fire department, needed some extensive work, which quite honestly, we were gonna have trouble doing. Kishwaukee College has a diesel program and they agreed to take our truck for the, the winter as their winter project and they rebuilt all the hydraulics on it and they did the engine and it got parked inside for the winter, which was really exciting for us. And then it got to come back and all we paid for were parts. And so for us, that was a, a big deal. So thank you for asking. Um, career exploration, we try to get our students out. One of our goals, and I know you saw that with strategic plan, uh, work-based learning, we want our students to have a chance to get out. Tomorrow, I have a field trip of students going to the Kane County Coroner's Office to learn about crime scene investigation and, and uh, autopsies. Uh, and I also have someone from a federal agency I can't name who's going to be in our computer classes talking about cybersecurity. So um, I don't think I have top secret clearance. So <laughs> you may, but I don't. So anyway, um, and then we also, the, the money goes for purchase services. Uh, whether it's you know maintenance contracts on equipment that we have, or um, you know paying other things. Yes, sir. So one of your bullet points is uh, faculty upgrades. Mm -hmm. Facility upgrades. Facility, I can't hear you. That's okay. Um, I think that was part of the discussion that we were having when we were going through the whole bond. Issues, sure. Whatnot. What what can we and can't we do as far as let's say you we want to stick you guys with the bill for ten million dollars to upgrade the building? <laughs> can we do that? Um, well, you can ask. <laughs> you can always ask. Um, we don't have, I mean, I don't have that kind of capacity and we can't, we're not a taxing body. So I would then have to go back to my districts and ask. And, and what I did when you were going through this process is I sent all of my superintendents who make up my board. Uh, just, uh, we had a little conversation about that Kinlan was considering a referendum and these would be some things that, that were possible. And then asked them, would they be able to respond to to that or what would that look like? Um, at this point, that's not something that just, you know, without, in some cases, they said they would have to go to a referendum to increase what we would need to do that. Say that again, please. So um, I think it'll get more clear when I talk a little bit more about the actual finances, but. Okay, that's fine. No, 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 that's fine. So what happens is that I, I build them. So a few years ago, Keeneland replaced the roof on the wing that Fox Valley uses at the high school. Mm -hmm. It's about a $175,000 project. I didn't have that kind of money available to do that. So what uh, we did is that we paid Caneland back $17,500 a year for 10 years. And I built that into the tuition costs going to my districts. And so then that money came back in and then we paid 
the the bill over time. And I understand that you work on basically a zero based budget or zero budget. Right. But if this board said, since it's our building and our stuff, and we want to, I'm, I'm just going. No, no, I, that's fine. I mean, uh, that's logical. If we said we, we, we want this to be upgraded as part of the bond instruments. Can we? I guess I'm asking what we can or can't do. I mean, you could add it into your tuition that we pass back over time. Well, that would be the the thing we'd have to to look at. Now, ten million dollars would be. I, a, I just picked a. Rate. No, no, no. I understand, but that's. I mean, it would be a pretty significant uh, increase and and the fear I would have if it's too large an increase is that the districts may say well do we have other options um, you know even even following the, the the heads up I did get a call this last week from a district who wants to talk about can they host one of the classes on their campus um, so it could be that that's something that happens now we've done that in the past historically we taught we used to build houses out of St. Charles we taught the health occupation classes at Mooseheart for 20 years. So it's not that we haven't taught in other locations and we can do that. It's just that I think people are looking at their options. Everybody's in the same boat, costs are going up and how do we control that? So um, yeah, if, if Caneland moves on that, then obviously I will take that to the board. Dr. Layden is the chair, we'll discuss it and we'll have to look at what our board is willing to do and what other options are there. And I think that they'll look at all of those things. I feel like the, the answer you got before Mr. Carey is kind of maybe. <laughs> I, I, I'm not giving you a good answer because I don't know. Um, in terms of facilities, one of the things that, that we do every year with our business partners is look at, do we need to improve equipment? Do we need to look at other things? We were having an issue with our welding shops. Uh, they were the original uh, ductwork, the original fans. Um, they've certainly been maintained, but they were not keeping up with the, the gases that we were producing and welding. And so what we're having to do is prop a door open and have a, a, a big, like a barn fan to keep our air going because we were getting down on that. So I wrote a grant to replace the fans with much larger versions, more powerful versions. And then I got the grant and we bought the fans in June. We ordered them in March or February. Um, and then in the July budget, then I budgeted to replace the ductwork and have them installed. The old fans were in the shop, they were very loud, and they weren't doing a good job. The new fans are more powerful, they're mounted on the roof, and then we replaced the ductwork. I know it's a very exciting photo, but if you look, <laughs> we're really proud of our new ductwork, actually. So uh, we've got new ductwork in the welding shop, and it's, it's, it's made a huge difference. We no longer have to prop the doors open to, to keep the air quality good, which... I think is a, a good thing from a safety standpoint. So when we do facility upgrades, what we do is work within usually a multi-year budget. We replaced the, um, the lift that we use for alignment not too long ago. It was $23,000. We actually bought the parts for the lift on one year's budget and we paid for the install the second year's budget and had it all done kind of around the July period so we could swing that kind of money. So. Um, so just, I know I gave you this, this uh, in your packet, but for us, everything starts when enrollment numbers start coming in. So Caneland started talking to juniors uh, today and tomorrow. As those numbers come in, we look at students who register with us. Once we have an, the numbers kind of like the, the conversation that uh, Mrs. Garland had, um, then we build out our staffing plan and what classes we're gonna offer. And then we start trying to, to develop a budget based on what we know with, with costs. So in this particular example, if, if uh, it was a $1.8 million annual budget, um, I, I write grants every year for the state for the career and technical education improvement grants. And that's been running about $300,000 a year the last seven, eight years. Um, and then we don't really get Perkins funds. One of the, the things that happened with how Fox Valley came about is that Fox Valley writes and gets to keep CTEI grant funding, career and technical education improvement grants, which is more state-based. There is Perkins 5, which is the federal program. Perkins monies go to our sending districts so that they can fund their CTE program. So we actually sort of leave money on the table. We could try to get that because we are a, a school focused on that, but that's one of the things that we do. We focus on the CTEI and leave Perkins for, for you guys, essentially. Um, Caneland gets about 15,000 
annually in Perkins dollars. Yeah, it's not it's not a huge amount. It's based on the number of kids we have. Um, so anyway, with if I take the the total, the one point eight million, and I subtract the three hundred thousand in grants that I've got coming in, our needs would be a million and a half. I then look at eleventh day enrollment. We always make sure that the the enrollment has stabilized. Now for us, it's our eleventh day. Generally speaking, when we start school, some districts send one day, some send another day, some send the next week. We have to pick our, we just pick something that's consistent for us. Our 11th day, and then, then we just simply take that one and a half million, we divide it by two, because we bill by semester. So now it's 750,000, and we divide by the number of students. So it's pretty easy math-wise. If we had 500 students, it's about 3,000, that's an annual, or 1,500 a semester. Um, obviously, the, the more students we have, the less cost per student. And, and where that gets difficult for us, last year when we were setting our budget and looking at staffing, our enrollment numbers and our actual registration coming from all of our districts was about 550 students. We opened this year with 420. The painful part of that is, you know, that once we've made a commitment on certain things, we're committed now, we always take about 10% off or more, figuring we're going to lose some to moving or they didn't get their grades up or whatever, but it's hard for us to know. So the, the message we have for all of our student service folks is the more accurate you can be on your end, the, the more accurate we can be. I would love to not build so much up front, because to be honest, then I wouldn't be giving you so much at the end of the year. It would, it would be a tighter window, but I, I can't necessarily guarantee that. So. Um, so the registration piece is really critical. And then obviously, as you mentioned, Mr. Kerry, we don't really hold over money. We don't build a big balance up so that we, I wish we did. If we'd had a lot of money, then we could have you know, maybe funded a, a, a wing or something right away. But that's not how we work. We give our money back to the, the districts. And we do so over the months, usually of August, September, and October on three payments. And that gives us some, some years it goes September, October, November. Uh, what it does is it gives us a chance to make sure that we have income coming in from tuition so that we're not ever coming to Caneland and saying, hey, we need to make payroll and we don't have money because we did a refund. So we spread it out so that there's always money there. All right, that was like 54 years of history. <laughs> I'm a little winded, but that's okay. What questions do you have? Dr. Burkle, can you? what are the biggest hurdles for the, not the Caneland students, but the other students? getting to the Fox Valley Bowl. So the, the, one of the things that's a, I'll answer it in two ways. It's a real, real blessing for Caneland because we're on campus. So for a Caneland High School student, it's two periods. Our classes are always 100 minutes because we feel you need enough time to actually do something in the shop. But it's only two Canyon, Caneland periods. Right. Um, and then we work with Caneland's schedule. So if it doesn't quite line up with, say, the, the newer schedule with early release or whatever, Caneland students are able to leave. If you are coming from Batavia or Geneva or St. Charles, you need at least three periods because you've got that transportation piece. Um, so typically they like to, to tie that to either a study hall or a lunch period or something. So a lot of times their kids eat on the bus, they pack bag lunches and do that so that they're not losing so much time. But that's always the difficulty for them is it, it is a longer period of time. Sorry, three periods is tough. That's a lot. Of it is. It's a big chunk of day. You'd have to have a lot of good planning. Well, and that's one of the reasons that that we attend all of the say freshman open houses for all of our districts. Um, we talk to the counselors. We want to help people. And when students, as they're going right now in Caneland to the the library to set their schedules, they're to come with their four year plan. Yeah. And we want our students, if they're interested at all, to have that in a four year plan. So as they work with their counselor, they have room in their schedule. Um, now, we have students that do early bird PE and that sort of thing to create more room so that they have the, the capacity to do that, but it does require some planning. And then if, they, you know, if they've not been very successful in a class and have to make something up or, you know, later on, that can take away their ability to, do, to take a class as well, which those are, those are life choices. Or 14, which is a tough life choice. Yeah, well, I, no, I get it. That's a... That's a it's tough sometimes for somebody, and I'm that's way past yeah, 14, so. Do you know, and if you don't know, I don't need like hard numbers, but like roughly percentage-wise, how many um, how many students in your enrolled programs are Caneland students versus traveling students? 
this year it's running, uh, I want to say like 43, 44% Caneland. Okay. Um, when I started, we were running generally in the 30%, 33, 34%. It's gone up. It, it could be a little higher. So second semester, we'll always have a, a few fewer students. So I know of at least six students who are graduating early. And then we'll have a few that for whatever reason can't come back second semester. So um, that typically bumps Caneland up a little bit. You could be close close to 50% this year, but that's historically not been the case, but that, that is where you're at about right now. But it's, a, it's good, because that means other people are still using the service, right? Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah, so well, and I, the other part that's fun for us, I mean, if we have 220 Caneland students and you've got, what, 13, 1400 right now in the high school, that's a pretty decent percentage of Caneland students who are, are able to take advantage of what I am in totally biased in saying a wonderful <laughs> program. So, um, you know, I think that's a good thing that we're available. Thank other you. questions? So the other schools, the, what is it, 57% other? So they figured it out, the transportation, they're not... Three yeah, it, it, so how does that look like for the other schools? So when we set a master schedule, we work with the school. So um, Batavia right now is sending first and second sessions. So if we have programs that this enrollment is heavy Batavia, we will schedule those first and second so that their students can attend. And we've got students, uh, some years Caneland has done first and third, but they haven't wanted second because of their, uh, their schedule. And so we try to schedule, we build our schedule around what will maximize student attendance. Most of our districts send their students every day on our schedule, period. Um, with the exception of Geneva, uh, it's once a month early release. When they do an early release, they send their second session students till 1030, and they don't send their third session. Don't ask me too much beyond that, but some <laughs> of our districts, you know, they'll, they, they play with that. One of the things, and I know this frustrates Caitlin a little bit, um, and I get it, we don't change our schedule because we have all of these other districts. So if Caneland has to adjust their schedule or do something different, it's fine with us. Students can come and go because that's work. Sometimes people have a doctor's appointment and do whatever, and that's making adjustments. But we don't change our schedule because we have other districts' transportation linked to our schedule, and we really can't play with that. So we are uh, boringly consistent. Other questions? Thanks for the Thank opportunity. You. Thank you. Thank you. So we're kind of going to jump away from the Fox Valley topic and come back to it in a little bit because we because of the consent agenda item that was moved. So now we're going on to J4, which is the approval of policies from press on first reading. Yes, um, in the packet you saw the extensive uh, policies. There are 35, 36 policies. Uh, I just go around, and, and what I like to try to do is um, provide the board uh, when there are specific questions. So um, in this, first let me rewind. Again, majority of the updates that you'll see along with this packet I get a little uh, cheat sheet on each policy that says, is it a statute update? Is it a code update? Is it a footnote update? So in those instances, probably 95 to 98% of the uh, updates and policy are based on uh, codes, statute, footnotes, end notes, legal references, um, and semantic changes or language changes that the uh, press has found to be more accurate and updated. So in those instances, you'll see in the packet I just put OK on it. And by okay, that means we've reviewed it. I've reviewed it with cabinet members who oversee this policy in their position. And once the board approves this on second reading, we then take the policies back to um, each department, each building, grade span, wherever it needs to go to make sure that we're updating it. Um, in addition to press policies, um, annually, this year it's in December, the 14th and the 15th, the Regional Office of Education sends two representatives, they come, they camp out in the district office for two days and review all of our policies, review all of our governance, review all compliance obligations that we have for the state of Illinois. And there's a probe of hundreds, <clears throat> hundreds of updates that we have to have and to show to make sure that we're in compliance. 
So in addition to the board approving these, it's also, um, also through the Regional Office of Education. So for this specific packet, uh, I can answer any questions that you have, but I wanted to highlight for sure 5250 because that is one that had the question, and the question was specific to um, vaccination. Uh, I'm sorry, um, are we testing COVID-related for vaccinated staff members? And the default question on that one is no. So that one is no, um, and it's been no all school year uh, for us and most of last school year also. So that one's following the default. Um, and then the other one I wanted to highlight uh, was policy 7180. And in that one, that is exactly the name of it, uh, prevention and response to bullying, intimidation, and harassment. And in that one, uh, the officer for each building is initially the principal. So in that one, I updated and will update all of the names from um, Mr. Schmidt to uh, Mr. Faulkner, from Jill Maris to uh, Dr. Horn, update each of those. And then the other thing we'll do too is, because it's not policy that's being changed, it's just the names inside, we'll do a search for all of those names and any other policies that might have a principal name or an administrator name that needs to be updated. And we'll just update that as part of this process. So with that, again, this is the quarterly review that we have. This is on first reading. It comes back to the next meeting and consent. We wanted to see if there were any specific questions that you had within the almost 40 policies that were. That we have no control over. For, for the most part, we have no control <laughs> over those, correct. And those that have questions are the ones I highlight, and that's one or two per package. Anything? Anyone? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You'll see it come back again after approval on consent okay. on the next we have a recommendation here so we yeah, i'm sorry we, we go ahead and yes okay so if there are no further questions i'll entertain a motion that the board of education approve the recommended policy changes from press on first reading so second my roll call please <coughs> dr lawler aye mr mankivsky aye mrs simmons aye mrs witt aye mr gonzalez aye mrs junk aye mr carey aye and carries seven zero. So we'll move on now to the added item from the consent agenda, which was H four, the approval of the Fox Valley Career Center fees for use of Caneland facilities, which is now J five. Since I'm the one that pulled it, the reason I pulled it was it just seemed like maybe listen to the presentation about how those fees are determined before we actually voted to approve them. I don't really have any additional questions. Oh. It's just order of operations. Okay. Than anything. Anyone have anything they want to talk about? If not, you already answered my questions during the previous presentation. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Then I will entertain a motion that the Board of Education approve the recommended fee proposal for the Fox Valley Career Center for the use of Cayman facilities for the 2023-24 school year, in the amount of thirty-four thousand one hundred and fifty-two dollars. So moved. Second. Second. And a roll call, please. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mrs. Junk. Aye. Mr. Carey. Aye. Dr. Lawler. Aye. Mr. Mankiewski. Aye. Mrs. Simmons. Aye. Mrs. Witt. Aye. Motion carries 7 0. That concludes new business. We'll move on to the superintendent and the board report. Yes, the first report I would like to, if you don't mind, turn it back over to the board for President Witt and uh, Board Member Gonzalez, who attended the joint annual conference. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, and if you'd like to share a little bit about what we do in this process, I'll let board members go first, and cabinet, and then we have uh, Mrs. Orfel and Principal McCoy that can also share some of their takeaways from the conference. Okay. So I guess I'll start and tell you. So um, I attended uh, two pre-conference workshops this year. The first one in the morning was called Partnership is the New Leadership. Um, it was a pleasant um, motivational speaker not exactly what I was hoping for but um, basically it was be nice to people and and you know forge partnerships you know and it's a good it's a good idea when you're a leader to do that <laughs> basically and then there were a lot of cute stories and 
Um, one of the most interesting things that came out of it was when the board members in the room start to discuss how they forge these partnerships and, you know, somebody stands up and says, well, I'm a board president and nobody does anything. You know, everybody, parents do things for teachers and, but um, nobody does anything for administrators. So every year as the board president at Christmas time, I buy them gifts. And of course the hairs on the back of my neck stand up because it, that isn't exactly legal <laughs> for them to take those gifts. And it's probably not a good idea for one board member to do that. And you know, it's so, you know, these things get, you know, there's all, you hear all kinds of things with these things. So that was the morning. It was fine. Um, the afternoon was um, engaging the community, was about engaging the community. And it was um, given by a specific school district. Um, you say it was a consolidation of like five high school districts. 214? Yeah. Or 211. 214. Yeah, those are five high school districts. Yeah. Um, and they talked about engaging the community and they did things. Um, you know, I, I think there was there was mixed reaction in the crowd because they did things like um, a board member shadowing a student for a day. Um, they talked about board members popping into classrooms and schools and you know it, that made you know half the room was excited about that and the other half was pretty uncomfortable with it you know because it it disrupts the learning process so um yeah again in there there were things where people one lady said well i wanted to know what was going on in the district so i signed up as a, as a substitute well legally you really sh you can't be paid by the school district as a substitute um so, and then another one said, well, we decided we were going to buy all of our staff and teachers a $10 gift card, you know, and again, that's, you can't do it. <laughs> so there's, you just hear all these things, that, those things make it a little interesting, but, um, you know, I, I, you know, if we were to engage in, in those ways, you know, that would be the, the right way to do that is to go through the superintendent. He's the guy we hire. Um, it's certainly not recommended by the IASB to, you know, or anyone else to pop into classrooms or schools. I mean, that makes, it's disruptive and makes people nervous. So, um, so that one was, that was that one. <laughs> and the other one, I, um, I went to a class on, you know, what under the Open Meetings Act can be, um, can be foyable and, um, we've all had some crash courses in this lately. Um, you know, anything that, you know, that happens at the meeting, you can expect, you should, you should be expecting is, is on, is part of the public record. Um, one of the things, um, that they talked about that was new, not new information, but the way they presented it, I think was, you know, opened my eyes a little bit was, um, there are things like a lot of times we have our attorney present in closed session. And so we wouldn't necessarily have to, you know, release those, those tapes or anything like that. Um, one of the reasons is because of attorney-client privilege. But there are things that break the privilege. And one of them is if a board member, any one board member, were to break the confidentiality of the closed session. So if a board member did something, you know, went and talked about what we talked about, um, then if there was legal action, you couldn't claim attorney-client privilege and you would have, they would have access to the tapes of your closed sessions. The other things that can do it are if you go into closed session for the wrong reasons or for no reason at all, there are people who do that. We're, we're very strict about, you know, making sure we're only talking about what we say we're going to talk about. So um, some of that was affirming about how we do things and, um, just, you know, open my eyes to things. Um, if you're using your, you know, if you're using your personal email address for, you know, board business, you can expect that that's um, part of the public record. So um, just, you know, the best thing to do is to keep everything with your board email at all times. And then it's on the server. And if it's FOIA, then it's right there. And it's all good. And text messages and social media and all those things, those count. 
so so that was pretty much my my take <laughs> Adam all right um <clears throat> the two pre-conference workshops I did was um, in the morning we did the basics of school finance um, which basically at a high level went over fund accounting and um, school finance uh, Dr. Fuchs does a very good job in all her presentations of giving us a good understanding, so I feel like I was ahead of the ball on that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's informative, and it's also it's always good to hear things from a different perspective. Um, my afternoon session was uh, Get Ready to Govern, and basically it was an overview of governance and um, discussing the role of a board member and... Um, where we fit um, in the district, um, particularly the, the huge takeaways for me were, um, you know, not being a micromanager. We're not managers. We're not responsible for um, uh, oversight of personnel. Um, we, you know, it's, it's not our role. So, so not only that, but also handling the public because you, you know, you, we, on occasion you do get the parent that's upset and they want you to do something. So it, it was very informative. Um, one of the big takeaways from the entire the entire conference uh, that I had was um, there's a lot of new board members out there. A lot of them were, um, at least in my groups, were um, green, um, whether appointed or just recently elected. Um, seemed to be a lot of uh, fresh ideas, perspectives, and a lot of learning, um, which was interesting. Um, so then Saturday I had the delegate assembly, um, which is interesting. If you guys ever want to uh, partake, that there was it's it's always fun to see the dynamic between Northern Illinois and Southern Illinois, and that's an opportunity for them to both come up to the microphone, speak their minds, and um, it was it's it's I enjoy it, it, it entertaining at the least, but also um, informative. Um, the rest of the day, I did a collective bargaining. Um, I guess it was a panel. Um, I was involved in the um, the last negotiations. I enjoyed it, and so anything I could take away from that, I was trying to learn and build on that. Um, my afternoon one, my last one, was rethinking school violence. Um, it was a new uh, uh, class or a new um, uh, segment, and so... Um, Interesting concepts uh, opened my eyes to some stuff, um, and uh, you know it, it was it was good. Um, and then the last day on Sunday, I woke up and went to the um, new board members uh, group again. Um, I went last year as a true new board member, but I enjoyed the discussion so much, and I enjoyed hearing the struggles that other new board members were going through enough that. Um, I wanted to go again, and it, it was nice because this year I felt like I was a little more, I had a little more seniority, and so I was able to speak up and give some insight into certain things um, with these other people. So, um, you know, overall, not coming from an edu education background, being new to the board member setting, um, I can't speak highly enough to the entire conference for me um, in terms of growth. Uh, and I, I know you guys are probably sick of hearing it, those of you, those of you that went, but um, so much value added for me to, to, to grow and learn and get an understanding for what this role entails and, and also how to, how to um, be better in my role for the entire district. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. I, um, thank you for attending and um, as the new information for next year comes out, comes out June, July for um, current board members at the time. We'll make sure we pull that out again so see who's interested um, in attending. Um, I always like the conference um, because it's, because because of the fact it's annual, it's always timely. So whatever our, our board might be dealing with at the time, there's always some workshops, whether it's negotiations, whether it's budgeting, whether it's school violence, school safety. Um, this year I attended um, two workshops on um, effective boards and effective transition of new board members because um, it's likely with an election in the spring that there may be a, a board member two new board members three new board members so um, as a result wanted to see what um, I know that we have set practices and protocols that we use for new board members tra that transitioning time between January February and March 
before the election and then after the election when any new board members start. So um, it's just good to see and hear another district of what they do. They shared some of their um, information, how they present it, what their meetings are like. So I'll uh, refer to that, compare that with what we currently practice for our new board members, and then um, shift and adjust. Um, another one uh, was um, the effectiveness of school board meetings themselves. Then there was a little handout that had 10, 10 ingredients. They called it ingredients. I don't know if the <laughs> guest speaker also likes to cook or bake or something, but it was 10 ingredients of successful board meetings. And so it talked through those, those 10 steps or the 10 things that should be evident at a successful board meeting. So what I'll do is uh, look at those, compare those again, and then also save those. Well, not save them if I know there's something we can imp improve right away, we'll do that immediately. Um, but then uh, save that conversation for uh, a new board member retreat and our uh, new uh, the board mem the board member retreat in June or July um, as we transition. So uh, those were both good. And then the other one that was timely was, uh, um, it's kind of a can you do it or not? It had a bunch of um, legal things that, that have taken place. And so part of the reason why I attended that one because it talked a lot about the political aspect, the political nature of being a board member or an administrator, and then also as it relates to referendum, because of the fact that we're going to be in that season shortly, talk a lot about what you can and can't do, and it had little questions. And at the beginning, it was interesting because everybody was very gung-ho to raise their hand, but there were so many wrong answers. By the time they asked about the 10th question, nobody raised their hand anymore because everybody was tired of being wrong. Uh, so it was good, good takeaways, good um, things to learn from that. So I always appreciate going, um, learning, and the opportunity to have the dialogue with board members and other administrators down there. So I'm thankful that the board, um, as board members can attend, they do, and that the board continues to support us attending the conference too. So I appreciate that. Dr. Fuchs, I'll, I'll let Dr. Fuchs go next, and then Dr. Atkins will share some takeaways. And then also, as we talked about, um, uh, Julie Orfold uh, attended for the first time, and Mrs. McCoy. So after uh, Dr. Fuchs and Dr. Atkins, we'll have our new attendees also share their takeaways. So, Dr. Fuchs. Thank you. I appreciate it. I also appreciate the opportunity to go each year. Um, even though I have experience in school finance, it's really important to stay current on the topics and I appreciate that opportunity. I attended the Friday morning with Mr. Gonzalez, and that was on the basics of school finance, um, but I had never heard this presenter before, and he was from, uh, some people would say Central Illinois, others might say Southern Illinois, depending <laughs> on your perspective, but his perspective was from mostly uh, non-tax cap districts and smaller districts and more rural and so it was very interesting, the perspective that he brought. A lot of the um, topics that he talked about um, applied to us, but some did not. And so I was thankful that you feel like this board, for the big topics, have a better understanding, and it just reinforced that for you. So that was good for me to know. Um, I went to a session on bonds and interest rates in particular. Um, if you'll remember a few years back, um, I think it was around 2016, 17, we refunded several of our bonds and we saved over $7 million by doing so. I feel really lucky because with the current interest rate market, um, there aren't a lot of savings to be had. And which is fine because right now we don't have any to refund, but we are getting ready to sell some if we pass a referendum. And so I just wanted to get an under, not an understanding, but a reminder of where the rates are and what that might look like in terms of how we wanna restructure our payments should the referendum pass. So that was good. And then I went to one on the tax levy. A lot of the conversation was around the new law that you saw in the um, updated board policy so they gave us a new law that said during the tax levy presentation and the public hearing, which will be in December, that we have to report our cash balances, but they forgot to tell us from when. And so you've got different attorney opinions, end of the prior fiscal year, end of the current month. Lots of people agreed. Every treasurer's report, we tell you what our cash balances are, 
So as long as you report a cash balance for a month, you should be in compliance. So I feel good about that. <laughs> but by the time they kind of circled all the possibilities and where we landed. But again, keeping me current, keeping us current, and following the law is very important. So thank you again for that opportunity. Dr. Atkins. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to just echo the appreciation that I have for the board uh, allowing us to go every year. Um, and as Dr. Layden said, it is very timely. Um, so in the morning on Friday, I also attended the school finance um, presentation. I, I would just share a quick little anecdote here as the presenter was struggling to remember what page a graph or chart could be found in a school finance textbook. Um, Dr. Fuchs was said, page 26, <laughs> because she, she knows it that well. And it's just a testament to how impressive her school finance knowledge is. Um, and then in the afternoon, I attended the community board um, relationship uh, session with Mrs. Witt. And it was good to get that perspective of the kinds of things a board might consider as they seek to um, engage with the community in different and innovative ways. Um, on Saturday, I attended two sessions. One was measuring academic success as a function of return on investment. As someone who comes to the board requesting um, dollars be spent on staff members that do different things or unique things, how do you measure those things? Um, but most poignant to me was a presentation that I attended on diverse hiring for, uh, that was brought forward by Rockford School District. And they do some very, very innovative things, um, entrepreneurial and creative things, out of the box things to attract and retain um, diversified staff. Some of those things are things that they have access to because they are Rockford and they have um, qualifications for certain grants and things that we don't. But there are other things that might be feasible for Caneland to entertain. And as we continue our journey to try to make sure that our um, instructional staff mirrors our students, um, there are definitely, I, I've not stopped thinking about it since attending that session. So I think there's some things that we can discuss um, and talk about in future years over time to try to um, bring in some diverse hires here to Canon. So thank you again, and it was a great time and um, learned a lot. It is a very timely conference every year, so. Mrs. Norfolk? I got to attend the um, Administrative Professionals Program of the I, which um, was catered to the administrative assistants and board secretaries. Um, being it was my first time, they had nicely highlighted some of the key things I should try to hit up. So I, mine was more of a technical one. Um, I started my day out with understanding FOIAs and that whole world in pieces and parts and information. Um, it was a great overview, a lot of exposure to rules, regulations, uh, maintaining your electronic records, your texts and those pieces. Um, as it was all new to me, I really appreciated understanding that knowledge and, and some awareness to it. Um, the other one I attended that day was the Open Meetings Act to understand compliance, pieces and parts, lots of rules, especially for um, that remote access piece. Um, that is so new when you can uh, call in for certain requirements and pieces and parts. So that was really an eye opening and we do it really well again. I over and over again through all of my sessions, we really follow rules and compliance and it, and it shows and it's really makes us, it made me feel really good about sitting there as a new person going, yes, we do all of that. <laughs> um, that session too also had a great guideline for onboarding new board members through those Open Meeting Act requirements the mandatory trainings we have to do every year and how I can need to upload those in a timely fashion. All tips and tricks as I process through this was super helpful. Uh, then there was a general session that I was able to attend in the middle of the day. Um, it was the founder and director for, uh, she was uh, of Conflict 180. More inspirational, but helping to deal with pieces and parts to cultivate purpose and connection during times of conflict and differences and motivating goals of the board, goals of the administration, and how I can support and move through those pieces and parts to support and results. And that was really eye-opening, kind of motivating was the feel good of the day, it was a good break for all the technical things I was learning throughout the day. Um, and then the last thing I attended was the agenda and meeting minutes. And I know it sounds silly, but that was what I was most looking forward to. It's my day in, day out, the bread and butter of what I do all day long. <laughs> um, it was actually a really neat session. It was the most interaction interactive session I was in. It was great to hear people who do my job throughout many districts talking about things that works, things that don't work, to be in a group and in a room filled with people who do my job. I'm the only one in the district that does my job. So it's nice to have other people around and to build those relationships with others. 
Um, that session also, they did a great job citing litigation and pieces and parts when the agendas and the minutes don't go right and things don't go right and it makes it hit home and makes it realistic and why it's important, giving value to what we do every day. So um, those pieces were good. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I just, I appreciate the board sent me. It was enlightening. I appreciated it and I learned a lot from it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Mrs. McCoy, please come on up. As Mrs. McCoy comes up, um, I'd like to share that this was uh, the first time that Mrs. McCoy has attended as a principal. Um, she's part of the superintendent internship program that she's working towards uh, superintendent certification. So as part of that class, I thought it would be helpful for her to come and experience um, what it looks like to work closely with the board, attend the conference with board members, and also see and learn um, at that conference. So glad you're able to attend and thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and I feel very fortunate to be able to have been uh, able to go to that. There were so many really great sessions, both in, in the pre-conference session and the session. It was hard to choose, like, the right thing to go to. Uh, my mindset was to try and soak up as many different kinds of opportunities to learn from different perspectives that one might have, from a central office administrator to uh, board members to citizens of the of, uh, of the community. Um, so I was able to attend the finance session with Dr. Fuchs and again felt very fortunate for the perch that I get to sit on and learn alongside her all these years um, and really, <laughs> you know, like was like teaching the class in my ear as we were kind of there. Um, so we're very, very, very fortunate for that. Um, then I was able to attend a session on district goal setting. So it was focused for superintendents and board members on how they would look at visioning, strategic planning, creating mission statements. It was interesting to have the time to talk um, to some board members who I think had gone to the session that um, Teresa, you had gone to earlier um, that day. And then this was sort of an exact 180 from all of the um, you know, everybody needs to feel good to having like really focused goals and monitoring how those get set and how that the board sets those and trickles down into student learning. Um, next, I went to a session um, offered by a superintendent and a CSBO in Southern Collar Counties on their bargaining process, which is super enlightening. Um, I've been able to be part of a negotiations team in the district. Certainly we've learned about that in our superintendent classes. Um, but the focus that they had was on collaborate, sort of their vision was they bargained against themselves in a way. Um, as a person who likes innovative and thoughtful, unique ideas, it was interesting to see how the two um, teams kind of came together to create a win for the employees that was valued on the things that mattered to, to the teachers really that were in the <coughs> union. Um, later that day, I went to a session on engaging um, a diverse community. So the focus from this school district was to really tap into community members that weren't part of the culture and fabric of the district and how to really um, connect with more diverse families that might not be, um, you know, the mainstream population, which was really eye-opening to hear different ways that different districts have um, approached that. And then finally, I went to an aspiring superintendent conference, and I think the first 10 minutes were, oh, it's so nice to see so many people here. And I heard once again the big shortage that we have in the state for pretty much every uh, position, but clearly the superintendent is one too. So it was nice to see a room full of people who are interested and learned a lot about how IASB and IASA can support people who are interested in seeking the superintendency. So thank you again for the opportunity for professional learning. Thank you. And um, thanks again for uh, this opportunity. Thanks for sharing out. I, I know that uh, professional development and taking time to take a weekend is not easy. So the, the opportunities that we do have um, for board members aren't, aren't, aren't numerous. So the opportunities we do get, uh, we're appreciative and appreciative to work together, knowing that our district believes it's extremely important and we continue to uh, support the joint annual conference every year. So thank you for that. Um, I did have uh, two other updates I wanted to share. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, tomorrow night is uh, our district information night. We have uh, four different topics. It's going to be here at Harder. We start in the cafetorium at 6 o'clock. And then from there are four topics that um, attendees can attend. There are two different sessions, so of the four topics, if somebody attends, you're able to go to two of them. Uh, we do have a rev update. 
on uh, what we're doing, what our findings are, and what the action steps are going to be. Uh, we also have standards-based grading. Mr. Raleigh will be there to uh, answer questions that any families might have, staff members that might have, uh, standards-based grading. And then also, as uh, Dr. Adkins talked a little bit about um, innovative, different things to try to do to hire, we also have a session there, uh, uh, HR, to be able to apply for a job, to be able to uh, learn more about our district openings, those types of positions. Um, then the last one that I'm going to uh, sit in on is just a Keeneland referendum session just to see what questions the community might have, what feedback, uh, just to also share information, uh, the factual information that we do have on the projects that are a part of it as kind of a, a overview, cursory um, information session. So that is uh, tomorrow night. Uh, we'll, we'll see how the attendance goes. I know uh, sometimes um, December, late November, it's a challenging time to uh, ask parents to come out. The weather changes, students are busy in activities. So we'll, uh, we'll obviously check the attendance and see how it goes. And if it goes well, we'll try to do something similar with different topics later on uh, this spring. So it's 6 o'clock here? Yep, 6 o'clock we'll start in the cafetorium. Okay. And then uh, the two different sessions from 6.20 to 6.50, 10-minute passing period. So our parents can have a passing period just like <laughs> students can, experience that for 10 minutes. And from 7 to 7.30 would be the second of the two sessions that somebody can attend. They don't have to go to both. They can only make it at 7 o'clock for one session, that's fine. Or if uh, they want to skip out after the first one, they can do that also. <laughs> Not that any of our students would ever skip out of anything, but uh, <laughs> if somebody can only make it to one, one would be fine. Um, then the last thing I have, the Hall of Fame Committee, um, which um, Board Member Mankiewski is our board uh, rep to the Hall of Fame Committee, meets on Wednesday from 6 o'clock to 7.30 in the district office. And at this meeting, uh, the Hall of Fame nominee period comes to an end on the 30th. So that night, we collect all the nominees. We talk through them. We see which are uh, nominees that have met all of the requirements, the nominees that have uh, all the supporting letters and information, uh, see which are still active from past um, nominees. And we update that, and we talk through that process. And we'll also talk about um, continued activities as we look at the 25th anniversary of the foundation. So those are the updates I have. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yes, I just have one other one. Um, not unexpectedly, our auditorium lighting project is having struggles getting components. And so we've been working with the high school, um, Mr. Rollman, Mr. Dr. Horn, myself, Dr. Layden, I believe at this point, we're gonna, um, they've started some of the project, the stairwells with the lighting on the stairs, but I don't think they're gonna put up any more scaffolding because once they do that, we can't use the auditorium. And um, we're gonna wait until June. Um, the parts are supposed to come in. Some will be shipped at the end of December. So they say some will be shipped in February. And so, we're trying to find a time when the auditorium is least used to disrupt the, the fewest number. And so um, there is a problem right now that we're trying to get a handle on of the existing equipment as we expected because it's old. Um, so we're waiting to hear if that can be fixed. Um, it has to do with the house lights. So right now, um, the auditorium is closed because they are working on the stairs, but it was supposed to be reopened uh, early to mid-February. I don't think that's going to happen. I think we may open it in January um, because nothing else is going to be done until June. So I'll keep you posted. Um, it's moving. Like we get, Mr. Payton gives us reports whenever they get updates. So. Yeah. Okay. It's just, it's, yeah, supply chains. Yep. Yeah. Slow all over. Okay. I see um, the board members have anything before we go to the oh. question and answer. Okay. I was just going to ask you if she had something. Anybody? Okay. Right. Lindsay, okay. you're up. <laughs> the mic, please. Thank you. Okie dokie. So the first thing I'll start off with is some sports updates. 
So basketball is in full, they're in their season already. So the first varsity home game for the boys is tomorrow, November 29th against West Chicago. And then the girls' first varsity home game is going to be Wednesday, December 7th against Sycamore. So that's going to be a really big game for them. And then boys bowling just earned third at the Copper Division at Plainfield at the Plainfield North Invite. And then Catherine Marshall, who is a member of the girls' golf team, she's a senior. Um, she was just awarded with the King County Preps Girl Golf Player of the Year, which is pretty cool. And then for fine arts, we just wrapped up our holiday concerts. I talked I talked about that at the last one, but the both of those nights were sold out, so that was also a pretty big deal. And then the Madrigals dinner is coming up, and that is December 16th through 18th. And then Bree Booher, who is a junior, she plays tuba. She just made All-State for ILMEA. This is a really big deal because this is only the third time um, Caneland Band has ever had this happen, so big kudos to her. And then for clubs, um, our chess team is still undefeated for the season. And then student council is also planning a winter dance. So that, as of right now, is going to be on February 25th. So that's something to look forward to, I guess, for students. And then for events, um, Mr. Kainland, I'm going to mention it again since I'm in charge of it. But <laughs> if you guys don't remember, that's a guy's talent show to raise money for the district. And that will be January 27th. And then just a reminder for all students at the high school, this week and next week is course uh, scheduling for next year. So for the freshman, sophomore, and junior classes that's going on and then I just hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving break so yeah that's all I got thanks Lindy yeah. I really enjoy this updates <laughs> thank you glad glad I think it's Dr. Lawler suggested it I'm glad we talked about it it's glad she <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um Okay, so I, that's the end yes. of the superintendent and board report, yes, and you. we'll move on now. Topics for future agendas. So, yeah. uh, something I kind of like to bring up to you guys to just gauge interest in it. Um, at the AAA, I noticed that um, a lot of boards are anticipating turnover, um, high turnover, and um, in preparing for that, they're developing um, onboarding packets, if you will, or, or some sort of process to help these new board members come on. Um, I know when I came on, um, obviously Dr. Layden did, did a good job of introducing, you know, and, and, and kind of we had a conversation, but um, there was there were a lot of things where I felt kind of lost for a while, and it took a while to to assimilate. Um, is that something we might be interested in discussing, or you know, to to ease people into it, understanding? I mean, for example, the agenda. For example, this right here on the agenda bringing up new ideas you know mm -hmm. discussing this is where we do this this is how things are done here um i don't know i just was wanted to throw it out and gauge your guys's interest mm -hmm. um yeah if, yes <laughs> i don't know if it's necessarily a topic for a meeting or if we do like two people to just get together and create some sort of in a bulleted list and bring it back and come up with materials like a committee like yeah. a small committee yeah. yeah i don't know if this is this is a topic but uh, it's something that i, I agree i think i would suggest good. that it probably should be people who are not leaving <laughs> um <laughs> you know i mean not you know just so that the onboarding packets have a at and least people who are maintain staying. Not that not that people can't make, come up with a good packet if they're leaving, but yeah, I think newer members remember more what we were missing. Um, but Teresa, you're leaving a lot of knowledge. So I, I was going to say there's value in the senior, <laughs> no, the senior I think members. Need to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's why I said those who are leaving. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's valuable. I think. Um, The procedural stuff, I think, is the most valuable thing. Um, 
because they're elected positions, how seven different members see what you should be telling people at an onboarding session could be there. You could have seven different ideas, you know, I mean, it, it, so I think the procedural things, yes. Um, but some, even some of those procedures then kind of come up for discussion sometimes. Uh, and so, so it's hard to present anything as this is, uh, this is the way things should be done or are done because a board could change the, all of that. And there's so many things that are not subject to, like we yes. talked about literally Press here's policies. the board members, here's their phone numbers, um, here's the meeting schedule. Like every year I have to remind myself to go find all of the dates and put them in my calendar. Just stuff that we can mm -hmm. get yeah, together that's... for new board members to say, here are black and white things that you should have. Mm -hmm. Here's the number of building signs we have, the number of students, the basics of our community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to put Ryan in charge of the act. <laughs> we don't have enough time. <laughs> I, I think there's other concepts that that should be addressed, particularly our role. So when I came onto the board, you have you have the parent that's upset about this or that, and I'm sure Dr. Layden is very patient with me. But I would write away email, you know, Dr. Layden, and he was always very professional with it. But looking back now, a lot of that stuff shouldn't have even I, it shouldn't have even gone to that point. It should have been handling it, you know, have you spoken with, have you dealt with mm. the chain of command? Mm -hmm. Things like that, that we don't, as a new board member, you don't understand. You just know that you're right. kind of thrust into that. And um, that is a universal thing, I think, that new board members don't. You know, you, you run for a position on the board thinking, you know, you want to affect change, mm -hmm. and you can, but you have to go about it, you know, in the proper manner. You can't just come in and start, you know. Right. Well, what a school board actually deals with, and we don't do the day-to-day -day things, right. which is what, you know, a lot of people get upset about the day-to-day -day things, so they run to be on the board. Mm -hmm. and we have nothing to do with the day-to-day -day things. Right. And I think to reinforce some of the stuff that we do in membership training, because we were told a lot of that stuff, but then when we got put into the role, and dealing with COVID or a lot of other things, referendums, stuff like that. Some of that stuff I think we forget that it would be a good reminder. Even like you were, um, Mr. Gonzalez, you were talking about emails, you know, scripting. It, you know, if you get a parent email and it's, you know, yes, no, yes, no. You know, it's like, if it's this, you can respond to this. If it's mm -hmm. this, it should go to the president or it should go to the, you know, superintendent. Just even like simple guidelines like that, that maybe a year later I wouldn't need, but initially, I was, yeah, same thing. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, was like, I was like, President Witt, do I answer this? You know, do I, and, you know, or I would wait for her to respond. So right. there might be things that I could have done more early on if I would have had a kind of a guide. So I agree. Mm -hmm. I guess I, all of this is valuable information to new board members. I'm just not quite sure how that boils down to a board topic. What is it that we want to direct them to bring back to us? I don't think it's a board topic. I think we just... I just brought it up yeah. because I didn't know where else to ask it. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. 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 So there is, you know, the, there is a... When people are running for the board, we do a session with the candidates, all the candidates, and we go through a lot of these things. Um, we... It's not always me, the board president. And Apparently, Dr. some people Layden. missed that memo. <laughs> Dr. Layden um, and Dr. Fuchs, and and um, Wait, like, and go over I you go over some of those things. Like you go internally, or you talk to the new candidate. We set a date, and we invite. We find once they tell us who's running, we yeah. invite all those people to come to a like an orientation session. I, I, I think the challenge with that orientation session is the fact that at that time, it's January, February, March, it's before the election, and we're talking about all of these things. Um, Dr. Fuchs talks about the finances, the budget. Um, the board president at the time talks about board member role. responsibilities, roles, duties. I talk strategic plan. I think it's a lot all at one time, and then all of a sudden somebody becomes a board member in April. They sit here. And all of a sudden, they have to start taking action, taking votes, and I think some of that is is lost. And so, mm -hmm. what what I reflected on by attending the conference is, what are the things that should be? How can we pare it down to make it 
more user friendly for here's the uh, get ready to become a board member in your first meeting and then other ongoing conversations as we get into other topics, other seasons, other times of the year that would be more helpful rather than throwing two hours or an hour and a half of a meeting at somebody before they've even started. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the challenge. And then when somebody does become a board member, they have to do the mandatory trainings and they do those things. And again, they'll do it, they'll do online, they'll check the box, we're in compliance. But then the issue is three months later, they get their first question, their first call, and to put it into practical application sometimes is a challenge. So, but, it, but it's good to be reminded of this as we get ready for that season, like you talked about, Adam, of potentially mm -hmm. new board members in the spring. One of the things as a, as a library person, um, there is a good reading list. You know, for things like this, there's, you know, one of, we always talk about stay off the dance floor. I don't know when you're at the conference, you hear that a lot, stay off the dance floor. Um, and there's a, it's based on a book called The Balcony Perspective. And so, and it's how boards are supposed to stay, you know, policy, vision, mission. Um, and you, you know, pass written policies and then pass it off. You know, basically, and he implements it and then he brings us updates and we evaluate how that's going um another one is uh the the fundamentals of illinois state school finance you know that that <laughs> workbook um you know there are just some some things that are that, you there's know, one on probably get... bargaining as well yeah it's and all... um yeah and then yeah. there's one on interest illinois interest based bargaining which is also mm -hmm. helpful so you know those kind of things it'd be good to to do that i don't know so how so todd take care of all that for us <laughs> um I, no i i appreciate um board member gonzalez bringing that up because again as i attended the conference i started thinking okay these it's that season we're going to be having new board members in april um, the onboarding process is not just going to be a one one-stop conversation it needs to be ongoing and then answering the questions as they come up too so part of that process between now and then we'll be looking at what we do like i shared and then what this other district did in other districts that um, also have similar type meetings and just make sure that we're we're meshing and merging all of it to meet the needs of new board members and existing board members too so that new board members get up to speed as soon as possible and uh, are ready when it comes time to april set the first meeting so, so you'll do that. <laughs> I, I will do that. I, and, and I agree with, with Board Member Jones saying it's probably not a board topic or a board presentation. It's just the charge to make sure that administratively we get that done. As the board president, we will work um, to make sure that we get that done and host those meetings and have that packet ready for new, new board members. I think other things like the economic interest statement and filing that and things like that. Um, and the training, Open Meetings Act training, and all those. I mean, you give them all that, I know, but. I actually think, as I mentioned at the last board meeting, we had the, um, the list that our board member Kerry asked us to put together. So we've got that list, that timeline. So those are all things that will be in that packet. But again, trying to share it and introduce it in a way that somebody can uh, ingest both short term and long term will be probably the, the bigger goal that we try to do. We're talking about this board members that intend to remain. You're going to need a president. <laughs> and it's probably better if it's somebody that's staying rather than somebody new. But so talk amongst yourselves is what I'm saying. <laughs> Not all together at the same time, though, right? No, no, no so all three of you can't. No. Yeah, talk yeah, once, yeah. talk yeah. amongst yeah. yourselves one at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other topics? Okay. Okay. This is the second opportunity for public comment. Start reading. You might as well just go. <laughs> You're the only one here. And you know, 
I was going to say, Tonya, is it okay with you if you just remember before he speaks, remember what the rules are? You know, thank you. All right. You have where I'm from and everything. We're good there. Yes, Maple Park. All right. Um, first, I wanted to say that I really enjoyed the presentation for FVCC. That is something that I've had a lot of questions about. I've contacted Dr. Fuchs many times, and thank you for your responses, but this was very helpful. Um, my husband went to Fox Valley um, 2006 and 2007, and then my nephew did as well, both from Geneva. Um, they came in early bird for PE, went until about lunchtime, left at lunchtime, and came here for the remainder of their day. So it was it was fun to see my husband do it in high school, and now my, my nephew did it as well. Um, so thank you for that. Um, the, I have like two little topics that I just have some questions or comments. As you guys talked about the new board members and elections and stuff coming up, um, my only request is that one thing that gets discussed possibly when emails get sent I know there's the chain of command I've learned over the last two years who to contact for what and who to ask for what but as a board member who's being elected by somebody else just respond that that's the biggest thing that I've heard from a lot of people just respond whether it's I can't help you with this contact this person or, you know what, that's a really good question. I'll look more into it and I'll get back to you. Or, I don't know, just say something because a lot of times it's felt like we're talking to thin air and I know you guys have heard me say this before. So that's just a little advice and request from this side of the fence. Um, the only other thing I have, um, I went to the CAC meeting October, was it on October, the last one? And we had a great um, presentation and tour of the middle school. I got to see how all of this does. I have little kids, so obviously I don't really come here aside from here and the cafeteria and stuff. So it was great to see everything, um, great discussion and stuff. We got to talk with the technology team as well and learn a lot about that. Um, one thing that was brought up, um, Mrs. Garland was there and they were discussing a little bit of Ignite. Um, the the registration has gone up a little bit from when we were there in October from the 50, it was like 60 and now it's 90. So that's nice to see. My biggest concern, and this was something that is being really, really hard to answer, are the buses and transportation. There was something thrown out about kids being bused with high schoolers um, and middle schoolers. And as a parent of a little one who will be in third grade next year, I'm telling you right now, my third grader is not getting on a bus with the junior. Like that just does not sit well with me. And so I strongly suggest we figure that out sooner than later because I know that that's a concern for myself and other parents. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other public comments tonight? Okay. Hearing none, um, the board does have a closed session for tonight where we're going to be discussing um, Section 2C1 under the Illinois Open Meetings Act, which deals with personnel. Um, and there will be no action taken following the session. Therefore, after the vote to go into closed session, the recording of tonight's meeting will be concluded. So I will entertain a motion to go into closed session. So moved. Second. And a roll call, please. Mr. Mankiewski. Aye. Mrs. Simmons. Aye. Mrs. Witt. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mrs. Junk. Aye. Mr. Carey. Aye. Dr. Lawler. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, everyone.